Welcome to Boiling Point, the podcast to motivate ever-evolving entrepreneurs and forward-thinking movement pioneers. Our hosts, filmmaker Greg Hemmings and executive coach Dave Vale, are turning up the heat in the world's business communities. Our interviews with entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and movement makers are raising the temperature of inspiration. Live from the hottest studio in this quadrant of the universe, here are Dave and Greg. And they'll appreciate how like out of the loop I am. Um, oh, man. And you guys well, are- listen. I, I just press record, Dave. So okay. um, uh, for our uh, for our listening uh, audience, we've been uh, going over some uh, some tech uh, geek uh, geeky conversations here with our uh, guest, Steve Waxman. And uh, because right now and most of you podcasters out there will understand this. Um, I am uh, not speaking through a professional microphone right now. I'm actually speaking straight into the microphone of the laptop because I've got the brand new MacBook Pro 15 inch uh, with the new M1 chip. However, it's not, uh, the drivers on my proper mixing board are not connecting. So um, I'm, I'm just giving a disclaimer for the couple of podcasters out there and, and musicians and engineers who are listening are like, that doesn't sound like a good microphone. So yeah. all that to it, say, Dave was getting a kick out of it. You're, you're, you're speaking to a very small audience. And then our, our esteemed <laughs> guests um, popped in and shared some, just, there's some language there. There's a whole, there's a whole vernacular that I have no idea what we were talking about, but uh, appreciating the two of you um, kind of going back and forth. So maybe, you know, well, I'll, maybe I'll, we'll I'm, share I'm, that. I'm happy. I'm happy to share. I'm happy to share. So I, I, I was asking them if they could see my pee popper. Cause I try to keep my pee popper out of the camera view. And for and, people that don't know what that is like me. Yeah. And so Dave didn't know what a pee popper was. So I, I brought it up here to show the pee popper is what's supposed to um, keep your breath from being too explosive into the microphone. And you can buy these for $25, $35, or you could do what I did, which was um, take an empty uh, feta cheese container, cut the bottom out, and then take one of my wife's nylon stockings and put it over the hole and just put the top back on and put it in front of the microphone. Uh, so, so the only, the only difference is we can't take your wife's stockings. We'll have to uh, take our own wife's stockings to to put to or, make our, or our own stockings. or your own <laughs> stockings. <laughs> yes, there I was. I, that's where I was going. That's where I was going. Thank you. So, listen, uh, Dave, uh, yes. you have not uh, officially met uh, my new friend Steve Waxman yet, but j- just for a little bit of. Uh, interest. Uh, Steve has worked with the likes of Neil Young, Alanis Morissette, Metallica, Blue wow. Rodeo, Bruno Mars, the list goes on and on. I see Wilco as well. Uh, yeah. Steve Wilco is one of my absolute favorites. I just finished Jeff Tweedy's How to Write One Song. Oh, book. I did too. I, I just, I just finished I just finished it last week. I loved it. Absolutely I think loved. I think we got to get Jeff Tweedy on this on the show to talk about yeah. his book. Um, anyway, uh, Steve has worked with a lot of the legends in the uh, in the music industry. And I met Steve uh, on a Seth Godin uh, right, right when the pandemic hit. Seth opened up one of his uh, uh, academy uh, setups for free for anybody just to come sit and hang out or whatever. And that's where I met Steve. And then uh, you and I kicked it off, Steve. And uh, yeah. I've been on uh, your uh, creationist podcast, which I was very Thank grateful for. Thank you for doing Thank that. You for that. And, um, and uh, I wanted to bring you on because you've got such a rich history in the music world. And now you're giving back to a lot of these artists and helping them navigate uh, the world of uh, the, the industry and the business. And, uh, but with that, typically uh, on the boiling point, we get our guests to introduce themselves. I've, I've, I've set the stage for you, Steve, but if you can uh, perhaps uh, even elaborate a little further for, uh, for Dave's sake. Let's see what I can do here. Okay. Um, I started in the music business in 1982 my first job was working for a guy named Bill O'Coin who managed Kiss back in the 70s. Wow. And, and when I was working for Bill, he, his big client at the time was Billy Idol. And it was around the time that Billy was starting to write the music for uh, the Rebel Yell album. Wow. So I was there through the entire creative process and recording of Rebel Yell. Brilliant. Which was a phenomenal learning experience for a young guy. I had actually, I'm originally from Toronto. I had gone to New York. I went to NYU to study acting and dramatic writing. And when I graduated, I have had this tremendous plan for my life, which took, a, which took a turn one fateful day when I went to visit a friend of mine who was the receptionist at O'Coin Management. 
and I, I sort of talked myself in or talk, you know, talked myself into a job there as the mailroom boy and not knowing anything about that side of the music business. And literally I started at 10 o'clock in the morning and probably by noon or one o'clock is like, this is what I want to do for a living. This is, this is just so cool to see this side of the business. And it's been an incredible journey. I mean, you know, as Greg said, worked in, you know, worked in management. I eventually came back to Toronto, worked at um, a couple of independent labels, one called Ready Records. My, the first record I ever worked was uh, The Spoons Tell No Lies Amazing. and Romantic Traffic, if people remember those songs. <laughs> I totally remember that. And then from there, I, um, I went over to Attic Records, which was Canada's largest independent label at the time, and worked uh, with Lee Aaron, um, worked from the beginning with Haywire. I think you guys out on the East Coast our, might our, remember our Haywire. Our boys, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And then um, one of the biggest records, actually, that we broke was the Jennifer Warren's famous Blue Raincoat album, where she mm. did song the songs of Leonard Cohen, which turned into a huge record. And then we ended up with uh, Maestro Fresh Wes. And Who, let can, your I, back can, I just, can I just pause you for a second? So yeah. I'm, we're, we're in St. John, New Brunswick right now. And I'm getting my hair cut. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and who walks in but Maestro Fresh Wes? Oh, cool. And then I see Maestro Fresh Wes again. I don't know if I'm blowing his cover, but he was at the Irving gas station with his son pumping up uh, the play, uh, a car with, I think what I saw was New Brunswick plates. So and I, I, I am serious. Maestro Fresh Wes is in St. John, New Brunswick. <laughs> I know nothing more than that, except well, you're going to have to do some, some digging, Steve. And I think I might have okay, blown... Well, uh, well, I, I have I have no idea. He it might be a <laughs> rental, you know. Consider that the last I I did go out for well, I saw him what a year and a half ago, two years ago now at the Juno. Yeah, two years ago at the Junos, we were hanging out at the Junos. There's actually on my website there's actually a photo of me, Wes, and Corey Hart together backstage at the Junos when okay. the Junos were in London. Incredible. Yeah. So, <laughs> so though, yeah. So maybe he lives there, or maybe it's a rental. Steve, but I, I'm just, I'm, just I'm, I'm listening, and uh, Greg will be impressed that I recognize most of these artists, and like, and and so I'm not as kind of tapped in as uh, as Greg or you would be into the music industry. But uh, man, those are these are some iconic names that you've just. Um, so how, for for the listeners, in yeah. what in what way would you be interact like you know like how when you talk about all this work you're doing with artists in what capacity you know and th- and maybe for for a neophyte like me you know just whatever however i could best sure. understand it greg, greg talked about you being a music coach because he knows i'm a, a business coach an executive coach i'm sure there's a better way to describe it well okay so it, i mean obviously it's an evolutionary process where you you know you know coming into it as a an, as a neophyte and a um as a mailroom boy, <laughs> you know, you kind of, you kind of work your way up the ladder. The, so I, I will get to explain the job in a second, but the very first, the very first lesson that I learned from Bill O'Coin was that those of us who aren't the artists are facilitators. And what we do is we facilitate for the artist's vision. So it's important for us to have an artist to work with who has a clear vision of how they want to be seen in the world, how they want their music to be presented to the world. And then it's our job as facilitators to represent them to the best of our ability on their behalf in the voice that they want to be represented in. Okay. So I learned that very early on, like literally that first week, he told me that when he saw that I was keen about what was going on and everything that I have done in my career has really been born out of that one simple concept. So when I came back to Toronto, like, you know, an office boy is an office boy and an office boy in a one, two, four, a four person office. And I was the fourth person. I mean, you do a lot of stuff and you're, you know, you see a lot of things you you know, you're, you're sitting in the corner for a lot of meetings, you're hearing, you know, how, how a lot of the stuff happens. And with regards to the creative process with Billy Idol, you know, being in the rehearsal room as they're writing the songs for that Rebel Yell record was an extraordinary experience for me. I mean, I, you know, I started playing guitar when I was um, 15 or 16 years old. And obviously like a lot of people that, you know, 
play guitar and want to be rock stars. I'd written songs and my friends had written songs, but I'd never been in the room with people that were writing songs that were actually going to be recorded and the songs that were that incredibly realized. Mm -hmm. So you really, you know, you start to see the difference between amateurs and professionals, as it were. Um, when I came back to Toronto, um, I ended up getting a job at, at Ready Records doing radio promotion and publicity, which are two things I had never done before, but they're concepts that you can, you know, that you can learn if you keep your eyes and ears open. So I talked myself, I talk, again, I talked myself, I talked my way into the job. And then when I was offered the job at Ready Records, I then flew back to New York and I sat in the office of the head of radio promotion at Chrysalis Records uh, on a Friday morning and watched what he did and watched how, what kind of arguments he made with radio programmers and conjoled them to play records and whatnot. Then I went and had lunch. And in the afternoon, I spent the afternoon sitting in the office of the publicist at Chrysalis Records, which is Billy Idol's label. And watched how she, you know, she would phone up journalists and, you know, and pitch them stories. And, and she taught me a little bit as much as she could in the three or four hours that I was there about, you know, how to put together a, a proper pitch and, you know, what kind of materials that these people would need. So I was on a Friday and then on the Monday, I flew back to Toronto and walked into the office, set up my chair. And uh, luckily the person that had the job before me had left um, a binder full, filled with phone numbers. And I just started calling people. <laughs> <laughs> and, amazing incredible you know and, and you know and i was really really lucky because people in the people in the canadian music industry are really really kind and when you have never done this before and you're calling you know radio programmers at major radio stations most of them are nice enough if you know if you just lay it out there and like dude this is my, the third call i've ever done you know <laughs> yeah. so here's my pitch please tell me what i'm doing right please tell me what i'm doing wrong which is please. a pitch in itself i love yeah. it yeah yeah and please you know please tell me how i could do it better and i promise i will learn and so that's basically what i did so for most of my career i have done either a combination of both radio radio promotion and publicity which you know is are both integral to marketing. So it all it all comes down to sitting in a room with the other marketing people and putting together the proper plans. Or I have done one or the other, <laughs> you know, depending on depending on where I was. Because the the next part of the story after Attic Records was in '92, I joined Warner Music Canada, and I joined Warner as the head of publicity, and I did that for a few years, and then circumstances at Warner kind of, it, it was a little bit of a turbulent time. And I ended up doing both radio promotion, video promotion and radio promotion. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. So radio, sorry, radio, video and publicity. I was doing all of that, which is a huge job for three people at a major label. It's, it's an impossible job for one person wow. <laughs> at a major label. And it was, it was, it was two years of doing that and working way too many hours just to, just to keep the paperwork flow going let alone the creative, you know, I, I like to think of myself as a creative person. And one of the things that I, tr that I've always tried to do to set myself apart from everybody else that did similar jobs is I always tried to understand the way other people had done things and then try to find new ways to do the same thing and not do it the same way that they did it, but differently just to do a different thing, to make a different choice and see how that would work. I always, you know, you would, you would always have convention to fall back on, but my, my philosophy in my entire life has always been nobody ever learned anything by being right all the time. So I, I was never afraid of being wrong, never it's, afraid of failing. And I, I'm just thinking about, you know, when you're, you're kind of um, pro dating all of us, I guess, to a degree, right? When you talk about Billy Idol, Rebel Yell, and you start talking about these various, but what a, what a massive change in the industry. Um, and, you know, like, I'm just, th I'm trying to imagine and how that philosophy would probably be really helpful as the evolution of this, of the music industry. Um, and I'm just, no, for like, sure. Every, cause, yeah. Cause I mean, every, every, everything that lost. happened. Well, this is the thing. The knee, I, uh, I don't know that it's unique in the music industry, but it certainly happened in the, in the music industry. As each 
new thing happened, people would be frightened and people would rail against it. And I, you know, most, you know, we're not talking about being frightened of CDs. We're talking about being frightened of, you know, technology like the internet and, you know, and social media and streaming and all this people, you know, people in the industry would be frightened because it's like, we're very, very protective of what we've built and we don't like change because it's been lucrative. So, so the, the, the knee jerk reaction is to be very protective. And then the people that, you know, are well, not gatekeepers, but the people that, you know, make the executive decisions eventually see the light and they open up to the possibilities of what each of these new technologies brings to the table. And I mean, well, even I, I said not CDs, but I remember even in the early days of CDs, because the sound was so pristine, there was this concern that people would just be able to buy one CD and mass produce it with CDRs. Right. You know? right, right. And, that, and that would take a huge bite out of the industry. So, you know, the, digi- the digitization, digitization of music was scary for a lot of people. And when that happened, like, like when I'm thinking about you evolving through, uh, you know, a few of those revolutions in the industry, but being able to be creative um, and kind of in a way go with the flow is probably what has helped you not only to survive, but to thrive and to, to pick up all of this wisdom and knowledge that you're able to uh, support other other people in uh, well, with. Well, I hope, yeah, I hope so. So Dave, to, to your, you know, to your initial question, when, you know, when Warner and I parted a year and a half ago, there was, you know, I, it was brought to my attention that there was an opportunity that, that was unique, that I could uniquely bring to independent artists who wouldn't, you know, people, people are in a rush to be successful and they don't think through all of the steps. And certainly when you're a creative person, you shouldn't feel the responsibility of having to <laughs> think through all the intellectual steps, mm-hmm. but it's helpful. It's help. It's helpful to understand when you're ready and to understand when you're not ready and to understand, you know, maybe these are, maybe there are some changes that you can make that, you know, that will help you get to where you want to go. Have you even thought of what your goals are as an artist? Are your goals realistic? You know, are you comparing yourself to you two and Lady Gaga and Madonna? Is that a realistic thing to do? Maybe as an ultimate goal, it's, it's something to set your sights on, but getting to that level of success takes a tremendous amount of luck and a tremendous amount of talent. Mm. And that's not to say that, you know, you could have a, tr- you could have that much talent and not make it. You could have far less talent and be huge, mm-hmm. you know, but you need, you really need to plan the path. And one of the unique things that I think that I have brought to the table for people is my own creative thinking in the way that I've worked with artists over the years to try and come up with strategies, whether they're publicity strategies, promotion strategies, or marketing strategies, but also having an understanding of what are the conversations that happen inside of a label, or what are the conversations that happen with a manager when the artist isn't around, you know? Are there qualities that you look for in an artist to, I mean, outside of their, their musical ability um, that, you know, would help you say, I could, I could represent this particular artist. I think mostly it's, you know, again, what is the artist's vision of themselves? Do they have a clear idea who, of who they are? Many times they don't uh, most, quite frankly, most times they don't because it's not something they think of, but I feel like, more often than not, if I spend a couple of hours over the course of some time talking to, talking to an artist, we can find that kernel of truth that is the focal point of where it is that they want to go. Whether or not they can then, you know, mine in that field is up for debate. But it, it certainly, you know, I think that more often than not, I can help give them focus. There are some people that are just, their focus is strictly on being successful. And, so, and somebody asked me at the end of a, at the end of a seminar um, a couple of months ago, they said, do you have any final words 
you know, for people listening. And I said, yeah, don't focus on success, focus on greatness. And I think that that's really, really key is that too many people set a standard for them, not even a standard. They, they, they set a goal of success that if they don't reach it, they will feel like they have failed. Mm. Yeah. I think that's yeah. in life in general, you know? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I really don't, you know, I, I think that people just have to, people just really have to focus on being as good as they, you know, whatever, whatever your love is. I mean, to me, if you get to make money as a musician, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the most fortunate thing in the world. And I, you know, even, even for the, you know, the young musicians I work with, um, the youngest musicians I work with, I said, look at, you know, your goal should be like, think about how much money you need to make in a year to have, to, to put a roof over your head and food in your mouth. That should be your first long t- long-term goal. Mm-hmm. Make a living at this so you don't have to do anything else other than make music. And there's a, there's a myriad of ways that you can go about making money, making music. Don't be stuck on, I'm going to make a record, it's going to get on the radio, and I'm going to be a big star. Because that happens to less than 10% of the people that are signed to major labels, let alone people that are independent mm, artists. That's a really interesting stat. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I love what you're saying there, too, is you know, are you doing this for the love and for the, you know, David, I keep talking about lifestyle, um, you know, a, a, you know, building a business around what you love doing, you know, or are you doing it to be rich and famous? One might, might not be uh, a better way than the other. However, one is definitely more sustainable <laughs> and yeah. predictable, um, which is really, really interesting thought, Steve. Um, one of the, just to change gears for a second, one of the main things that I, I know that you help people with artists with is their narrative. And you've touched on it already yeah. a little bit, but um, talking about story, like I, I work in the storytelling field, of course, uh, in film, but talk about the importance, like uh, even non-musicians, entrepreneurs who listen to this podcast would probably get a lot of, uh, uh, would gain a lot from your insight on how important it is to know what your story is. Like, like you said, who you are and how do you share that in, in an authentic way? Well, that's the thing. I, I think it's really important for people to understand that understanding who you are as a person, who you are as a creative is, re, you know, is key to understanding what it is that you're going to put out in the world and how it is you're going to put it out there because it gives you a, it gives you, it gives your, you give yourself a roadmap. And I think it's really important to have a roadmap. You need to know, where it is, where it is you want to go you can certainly take the you know the little the little b and c roads you know off to the side here and there but you always want to you know you always want to know how to get back to that main road to get to where it is that you ultimately want to go and i think that you know we'll talk about music but i i think that it works in all areas of life um whether you're a business person or a creative person, if you know where you want to go, you make decisions on that lead you there. It keeps you focused. I mean, there, there's nothing wrong, you know, being a musician, if you want to be a hard rock musician, there's nothing wrong with picking up an acoustic guitar and writing, you know, a ballad. But that's not, that's not what you want to put out in the world if you f- see yourself as a hard rock musician. Maybe you can take that same ballad and put some electric guitars on it, play it really loud, and maybe even at the tempo that you've originally written it, but it becomes a little bit darker and it becomes a little bit more of a hard rock song. You know, maybe that's, maybe that's you know, same song you speed up and it becomes a, you know, a different kind of rock song. And then the other, you know, the other guitar player, the keyboard player puts, you know, puts a musical line on it and it becomes something else altogether. But the point is, if you're a hard rock band, you're a hard rock band. If you're a pop artist, you're a pop artist. But it's like, what kind of pop artist are you? you there's mm-hmm. a million different ways. That you could be. So it's like, pick a lane. Okay. Pick a, you know, pick a lane and have the direction that you travel in that lane be, um, that's what I'm looking for, be defined by how you see yourself as an artist. 
be successful with where you want to go. And when, cause you, you know, you will get to where you initially think you want to go in whatever you do, you will get to a destination. And once you're at that destination, you have so many more roads that you can then travel. And then you pick another road and you travel off that road. But it's, but the, the thing that's really interesting is all ro- you know, all roads lead to Rome. All the roads that you travel will lead back to what your initial narrative of yourself as an artist or as a business person or whatever will be. Wow. You, know, you know, what's interesting is you were saying earlier, or I'm finding interesting is, <clears throat> you know, you know, person needs talent and luck. And I think what you're describing is um, creating a little more luck, if you will, by having a plan and a road and, you know, a sense of self and, you know, kind of where you fit increases your probability of that, you know, being lucky, if you will. I mean, it's, it's actually, and, you know, cause people say the harder I work, the luckier, you know, I become, but it's also, you know, working smarter and, you know, having working smarter is exactly what it is. It's, you know, you're going to end up having conversations with people and they're not going to want you to hem and haw there. You know, one of the, one of the things that I, with all due respect to you two guys and whoever might be listening, one of the things that really bugs me is when I say to somebody, what kind of music are you into? And they're like, Oh, I like everything. I like country and I like this and I like that. I'm like, okay, great. I guess we're not going to talk about music. No, well, let's, let's find something else to talk. about. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Pick your I, lane as well as what you're saying is what's your lane. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, it's like people, people think that you're being myopic. It's not, you're not being myopic. You're being passionate. You know, if you can speak to people with passion, they will buy into it. One of the thing, one of the big benefits of understanding your narrative is that you're going to bring on partners and, I, and, I, and I've been talking, I don't know if I was, I had talked to you about this, Greg, back in, you know, when we talked last summer, but I've been talking to people, artists, about understanding their value. They have value to their partners, which are managers, record labels, <laughs> and agents and people. And then you have value to your audience. So you need to understand that the people that are your business partners, they, they want to make money off of you. So you need to give them a clear idea of who you are as an artist and where you want to go as an artist so that they can, as I said before, as facilitators, speak on your behalf as though they're a band member <laughs> and have the same kind of passion as they go out and pitch you to, in the case of agents, to club owners or, you know, or promoters of bigger shows. In the case of a manager to all the other people that are going to be your partners in the case of a label, you know, whether it's going to be, what is their marketing strategy going to be, or what is the, what is the publicist going to do on your behalf? What is the radio promotion person going to do on your behalf? Are they talking your language? So there's that side of it. And that all comes out of you understanding a narrative so that you can articulate to them what it is. On the other hand, your presentation to the audience who now these people want to make money off of you, these people, you want them to pay you for your art. So what value are you giving them? What value are you giving them that makes them either want to stream your music, buy your, buy your albums, come to your concerts, buy your merch, join your fan club, whatever the case might be, or log on online and, you know, and fill your tip jar. What value are you giving these people? And again, both of those things that we call value are born out of you as an artist understanding your narrative so that you're communicating to these groups, you know, the audience on one side and the partners on the other. And everybody has a very clear idea of who you are as an artist. And you can, you know, you can look at, if you really think about it, you could look at the biggest artists in history throughout the history of pop music, well, th- probably through the history of all music, but certainly through the you know, history of pop music from, you know, 1950 to today, the biggest artists, sometimes you'd look at them and all you would see is an image. But if you really intellectualize it, you'll see the image is connected to what kind of artists they are and everything else that they're doing and everything else that they're putting out there. And I think this is such a good principle for <clears throat> any entrepreneur or any artist, uh, you know, uh, it, it might be, uh, you know, 
come off as unnatural for certain people just getting into entrepreneurship that this is as relevant. But when we think about what's the story to your stakeholders, the story to your customers, story to your communities, story to your employees, all of that, um, you know, I can say we work very hard. I work very hard, even just internally with my team at Hemings House, so they understand who we are as a narrative. What is our narrative? Why do we exist? You know, when I talked to you on the Creationist podcast, it was very clear what uh, what I'm interested in. You know, with business yeah. as a force for good. I'm a we sell films and videos. I probably could have talked to you about films and videos, but instead I, I I stuck to my story. I'm not saying I'm great at that yet, but it is a conscious decision to stay in that lane. You know, mm-hmm. um, so I appreciate you bringing that up, Steve. And you know, as we come close to the end of this uh, of, of this discussion. Why don't you talk about the podcast a little bit? Because it's really interesting, certainly to my thank ears. You, but uh, why don't we do a little uh, little plug for the the podcast? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate and I pre- appreciate you listening. So, the creationist is a podcast about people who create. I mean, it's it's really <laughs> that that simple, and um, it's born out of a personal sat- a personal um, obsession that I've had my whole life about creativity. When I was uh, a kid, I had seen a documentary on um, local, uh, it's called TV Ontario, TVO here, which is sort of like PBS. It was a documentary about Pablo Picasso that was done out of Brussels. And at one point the camera is behind a a pane of glass, which in essence becomes the easel. And you watch him paint on that easel and you see how the painting transforms and that choices that he made one minute, he changes a minute later. And you see, you, you see this picture change and morph in front of you. And I had never before, of course, in my life, I mean, I was too young to ever intellectualize, intellectualize the creative process, but it was right there. And you saw it happen. And I became totally fascinated with creativity. And so being able to spend now 38 years working with creative people has been a, you know, a fabulous opportunity for me. And I, you know, and I've always tried to be, you know, creative myself. I have a lot of, a lot of creative interests always, you know, whether it's playing music, writing, you know, drawing, whatever, I've always tried to be creative because I just find it so fulfilling and intellectually it helps my mind work. I mean, and so that's, that's really important. So a few years ago, I mean, I, I got into podcasting early in terms of listening to podcasts. And, I, and like everybody else who listens to podcasts, I think, ah, I should do a podcast. And I came up with a million stupid ideas that, you know, involve me talking to my best friends about the things that are important to us that are not important to anybody else in the world, including the, the sexuality of, um, of car names, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, you know, it, it starts with the Ford I'd probe listen. and goes from there. Yeah. I'd like- <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got, Any- it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, but, you know, one day, uh, one day, a couple of years ago, I was watching CNN and Anderson Cooper was doing a story on creationists. And when he said it, it suddenly dawned on me. I mean, I know what creationists are, but it dawned on me. It's like, that would be great. It would be controversial, but that's exactly what I want to do. I want to talk to creative people. And so, you know, but I never had the time. So when Warner and I, you know, parted ways, I immediately went into the process of learning how to record a podcast. And I started, you know, making notes to myself as to what the format would be and what a group, you know, and what kind of people I want to talk to. So in that first, so I've just finished um, season three, which happened to be all music themed, but generally each season, which are anywhere between seven and 12 episodes are not necessarily themed. So I've, you know, interviewed songwriters. I have interviewed golf course architects, fashion designers, uh, publishers, film directors, um, I interviewed Greg about, you know, creating a Ted talk. Um, I interviewed Hugh Syme who designed all of Rush's album covers. Um, I, there's a, there's an episode with Susan Rogers who was Prince's engineer, um, in the eighties for the biggest records that he ever produced. Uh, 
and we talk about what it was like working in, in the studio with Prince. And so uh, it's just, you know, one of the things is I want to insp inspire people to be creative themselves. I want them to understand the creative process that other people go through. And I, I thought that I, you know, I thought that through this series of interviews that, you know, wondered if there would be a through line of what creativity meant to people. And it's funny because Jim Cuddy from Blue, Rod Blue Rodeo was on the very first episode. And towards the end of the interview, I asked him where he finds his inspiration. And his answer to me turned out to be the through line for every other creative, which is, he said to me, sometimes I just have to work towards inspiration. That is, you know, that it's not just I'm walking down the street and there it is. Sometimes I have, you know, I have to sit here and work it through. And sometimes I have to, you know, walk from one instrument to another to see if a song is going to, you know, show itself to me. And it's been the same pretty much with everybody that I've, you know, I've got 26 episodes out now. And it's like pretty much everybody has said that same thing in one way or another. And I think it's, I think it's the same for everybody that has, a, you know, has their own business. It's like, you know, there'll be great ideas and, you know, great concepts that will pop into your head, but more often than not, you're going to have to sit and stew over stuff and try and have conversations with people in hopes that those conversations will open up a few more doors in your mind for fresh ideas. Absolutely. Um, I know we got to wrap this up. But one of the things I, I really I'm, I'm fascinated by is, and I, you know, I be, I'm sure there's a whole, we could speak to this for an hour um, is uh, or longer, but it's the idea of like having people understand their value, like that mm -hmm. whole concept. And Greg and I did a workshop with some artists and, um, mm -hmm. and I was shocked, like more visual mm -hmm. artists, I guess, but yeah. I was shocked at how, um, just where they saw their value. Like we had actually, we were pushing them and, and, and to hear some of the answers, I was just like, there's no way you could live on what you're describing as, you know, what people would pay for your art, um, this particular group of people. And I just wonder, it just seemed like, and I see that in the, in the coaching world, like, you know, it's kind of a, I think more creatives are kind of attracted to the coaching world and, and people being, you know, kind of worried about asking for what their value is. And I've, in, in my head, I always thought, well, if I can't, if I can't make a living, then I can't do this. And I, you brought that up earlier. So it's just, yeah. it's just an interesting almost dilemma. And I'm stereotyping here, obviously, but you know, the idea that a lot of, you know, more creative types don't necessarily um, understand what their value is or could be. Um, so I just, I just, I just wanted to bring that forward as a, as a thought, but I just really, you know, marrying those two ideas, I, I'm guessing is challenging at times. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a friend of mine um, who was approached by a company that wanted to bring him on as a consultant. And he had put together a proposal for them. And I can't, I can't remember if they proposed a price or he put a price there. I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I said to him, you've got to raise the price. You have to raise the price because they don't have what you have. You're bringing value to them. Right. They don't, you know, they, the reason they want to work with you is because you bring a certain amount of integrity and you bring an expertise to, you know, what they want to add. They can say no and, and, you know, and um, negotiate you down, but don't start at their price. Start at your price. <laughs> I think Very it's wise. it's it's it is brilliant, and uh, you, you know we see artists all the time with that with you know needing that information, but also entrepreneurs not knowing what they're. I, I, I mentor entrepreneurs all the time, like younger entrepreneurs, and I uh, I I do the math that you that you did, Steve. I was like, how much money do you need? Let's just do the calculation really quick. How much money do you need to pay pay your rent? Get groceries, have a little bit of uh, going out for a beer uh, or, or a meal. Um, what's that number? Let's figure it out right now. And then we come up with a number. I'm like, okay, 
you're not going to really be able to give back much either at this. So let's, let's up that a little bit. So at least you can contribute to whatever your local, uh, you know, animal shelter, whatever it is that you want to give back. You, you, you got to make some money if you want to give back. So then we figured it out. We're like, okay, you need your business to create $300,000 in a year then, <laughs> you know, like what? Mm-hmm. I'm mostly talking to video entrepreneurs, people who are filmmakers yeah. trying to build a, and I'm like, if, if you, if you're not, aiming to make a million dollars of sales in video, there's a good chance you're going to have a hard time to not only make your own, uh, pay your own bills, but to give back, you know, to make an impact. And um, that blows most people's minds, but it's really cool to give them that, that, that little, very small mathematical equation on, uh, on, on what your value is, where you can, you can begin to price yourself, you know? Mm. So yeah, anyway, I, I find that really super topical. Um, can I, can, I, can I just, I just want to add one more thing here because you, you just brought it up. One of the things that I try to encourage every artist that I work with, no matter how popular they might be, um, and certainly in my career, most of the artists that I've worked with is certainly developing artists are not popular at all at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that I try to encourage everybody is to find a cause as early as they can in their career. That's smart because I think it's important for them to understand that again, you have value as a human being, regardless of whether or not you're getting paid. And if you're going to be in the, you know, if you're going to be in the public eye, even if you only have 10 fans, if you're going to be in the public eye, use that visibility for some good. 100%. And if everybody did that, a lot of complex uh, problems could be solved <laughs> if everybody Absolutely. did that, right? Yeah. Well, well. Steve, th- th- this has been uh, an awesome conversation uh, as usual. And I-, I hope it's not uh, uh, the last one in a long time. Hopefully we can uh, continue the- these conversations. It doesn't have to be. I'm always here. Yeah, always yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it is great. And uh, uh, really excited to see uh, your your 2.0 that you're doing right now. It's it's very cool. And I'm, I'm always spreading the word. Uh uh, to my artists, uh, musical friends, that there's people like you out there that exist that can help. Um, Thanks, so with that, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you outside of the Creationist Podcast? I have a website. It's imstevewaxman.com. Letter I, letter M, like I'm imstevewaxman.com because that's who I am. It'll explain a little bit more of who I am. It uh, A little bit of you know what I can do, You know the, start, the starting point at least for what I can do for anybody as an artist, I quite frankly, everybody, um, everybody gets a unique experience. You know, everybody gets a unique experience. It's not, you know, it's not a one-stop shopping experience. And I do the same thing for everybody. You know, maybe some conversations are similar, but certainly the way we go about trying to help someone, you know, figure out what their narrative is, figure out, you know, what their goal, what realistic goals are and, you know, what road they, you know, maybe should consider traveling is different for everybody that I speak to. And so if you go, you know, go there, check it out. And, you know, you can always email me at imstevewaxman at gmail.com. Fantastic. Steve, you, thank you so much, my friend. Yeah, thanks. And you are a coach. That was a good description, uh, Greg gave. That's exactly, you know, <laughs> helping people find their way. Very cool. Thank awesome. you so much. It's really great meeting you guys. Have a great well, one, you, Steve. I already, you already know. You, it was nice meeting you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, always nice. it's always nice to meet Dave. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fellas, great shot. And uh, we'll see you next time on the Thanks Boiling Point Podcast. Thanks for checking out this episode of Boiling Point. <laughs> Remember to rate and subscribe to us on iTunes and follow us on Twitter at Boiling Point Pod. To see more from Dave Vale, check out leadershipunleashed.ca or visioncoachinginc.com and on Twitter at Dave underscore Vale. And to catch up with Greg, visit Hemmingshouse.com and at Greg Hemmings on Twitter. Thanks for listening and remember, keep that pot boiling. <laughs>